Hello. I'm glad you're able to listen to this message. If you're not involved in a church somewhere, we'd love for you to join us some Sunday at Hope Fellowship for one of our three services. If not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area that teaches God's Word. I hope you enjoy the message. Thank you, guys. I love the, the words, where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. You remember that when most of the disciples left Jesus? And they asked him, why are you guys still here? And he said, where else can we go? You have the words of life. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. We're grateful that we can actually sing like this and, and just be in your presence this first uh, day of the week where we say you're most important to us. We recognize you for who you are, the one who made everything around us. We, we understand that you have great power, you have great wisdom. We thank you that you loved us enough to do something to bring us to yourself. And the demonstration of that, Lord Jesus, thank you that you entered this world and you added a human nature to your divine nature. That you took our place in judgment when you hung on that cross and you rose from the dead by your power and you are now seated in heaven waiting for a time to return. And we look forward to it. We know you're going to close history. We uh, thank you that you've loved us like that. And uh, uh, the Spirit of God, we're grateful that you live in those who have put their faith in Jesus. We're grateful that you claimed us, that you're the one who's changed us on the inside. You made us alive when we were dead. And you're the one who turns us away from things that are wrong and and unholy towards those things that are good and right and true. And uh, I thank you that you've inspired words for us to understand things that we would never know. Thank you for this book that we have that you have preserved and inspired for us without error. And we're grateful that you're the one who brings them home to our hearts. You, you point to us and Help us to see those things that you want us to see. So do that this morning, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there was a, a jet flying across the United States. And, uh, you know, it was that time where everyone's just kind of fading off, going to sleep a little bit, and maybe watching movies and reading a book every now and then. Suddenly, the plane started to shake a little bit. People go, what's going on here? The pilot got on, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, We have four engines on the plane. One of them just went out. Don't worry. Three engines will get us to where we're going. Uh, just calm down and uh, enjoy the ride. But we will be a half an hour late. So everyone just kind of calmed down a little bit, started reading, watching movies, you know, got back to their routines, and all of a sudden the plane started to shake again. And, uh, and, and they're like, what's, what's happening? You know, the pilot gets on it, get, calm down, calm down. There's, there's two plane, there's two engines left. One more just went down. Said uh, uh, more than enough power to get us where we need to go. We will be another half hour late. It will be an hour before we get to the destination behind schedule. Uh, People calmed down a little bit slower this time, watching their movies, and all of a sudden the plane started to shake again. And then people are like, what's happening now? The pilot says, listen, we've, you know, we have another engine failure. We do have one engine, and that is more than enough to get us where we're going. And, and, one, and one guy just, he had about enough. He's in a business suit. He stands up and says, I have a meeting I need to be with, and if this happens again, we'll be up here all day. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been inconvenienced? Have you ever been inconvenienced? You know, our natural mode of operating in life, I think for most people, is to ask the question, especially people who don't know God, right? Even many people who do know God ask the question, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? When it comes to giving in some way. And you know, placing someone else above ourselves or in front of ourselves is a real challenge. 
And really, I mean, for us who know Jesus, it's a lifetime challenge. We grow, we grow, we grow, we go, we grow, and we grow more into doing just that, giving our life away. Because we're naturally selfish people, right? Years ago, the Salvation Army was having their international uh, convention, and uh, when they were uh, came time for the keynote address, they, they knew that William Booth, the one who founded the Salvation Army, was too weak at that point to actually show up to the conference to give a speech. And so he cabled in his words. And uh, when they got his speech, what they did is they were a little bit shocked, but they read his speech, and it was only one word, one word. And they just simply said, his speech is this, others, others. It's the only word that they read off of his uh, uh, outline. That was the only word he gave them, others. In Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 16, to remind you, of what the body of Christ is. Jesus is the head. Those who have put their faith in Jesus have been added to his body, placed into his body, so that we now, different parts of his body, form one. He says, it said in Ephesians 4, 16, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We're in this series I'm calling Body Building. And and you're going, it's because of his guns. No, it's because we're the body of Christ, and when we participate, responding to the head Christ, we grow stronger and we grow the way that God wants us to grow. And we build the body by responding to him the way we need to. And we will never grow, and I'm going to say this, the church of Christ in general, any local church, will never become everything God wants it to be and grow if people are not willing to serve, to give their life away for others. It just won't be everything God wants it to be. And so the question may come to us, are we others oriented in the way that we think and live our lives? Um, definition of serving, if you want a definition, here's one that I've, I've uh, added if you want to write this down. This is serving. When you're inconvenienced for God by doing something for others that must be done even when you don't feel like it, okay? It's when you're inconvenienced for God by doing something for others that must be done even even when you don't feel like doing it. That's serving. Now, uh, Jesus used a vivid illustration in John chapter 13 of exactly what serving is. And and just to refresh your memory on this, I'm going to read through John 13, verses 1 through 17, uh, of what happened here. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, "A, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you're clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that, that's why he said not everyone was clean. But when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've just done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. 
I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then he said in verse 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. When you think about what he said here, what he did, and here he is, you know, they're, they're in this meeting, they're going to eat the Passover meal together, uh, and usually stationed at the door when they come into this banquet room, usually they had a servant or a slave whose menial task was to be down there at floor level to take a basin of water and wash the filthy feet of everyone who came in, dry them with a towel, and they would move into the room. It was a menial job that only a servant or a slave would do, and they didn't have a high opinion of people who would do that. So they all came into the room not paying any attention to the fact that they were coming in with dirty feet into this banquet hall because there was no slave there or servant. And Jesus, at the appropriate time, stands up, takes his outer clothing off, puts a towel around his waist, kneels down in front of his fellow human beings there, and assumes the position of a servant right there in front of them. And, and they're flabbergasted. Peter expresses probably what everyone was thinking. <laughs> we're trusting that you're the Messiah, the the one who came from God and and, and who's going to rule and reign on the earth. Who are you? No. No, no, no. And and Jesus says, "I, I must do this. Right? I'm setting you an example, basically. You're going to do exactly what I'm doing here. And he washes their filthy feet. Now you think about what happened eventually when Jesus went to this place. What needs to be washed in order for us to enter heaven? Our filthy souls. And he went to the lowest place, as we'll look at in a minute, when he did just that. You know, boiling it down, what Jesus was communicating to those who follow him? Others. That's what he was saying. Others. Why did he feel the need to do that? Well, we go to Mark chapter 10, verse 35, and we find why he was motivated to do that, because this is humanity. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That boils it down to us as humanity apart from God. We are doing whatever we feel like doing. We're launching out into life saying, I'll use whatever I've been given for myself, and I'm going to live life however I feel like living it. And quite frankly, God, if you want to direct my life and tell me what to do, I don't want you involved. And if you do exist and you want to help me with what I want, please do. Otherwise, stay out. They said, we want you to do for us Whatever we ask. And Jesus probably had just a little smile in the corner of his face. He says, well, okay, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. See, what they're asking is they know that he's the Messiah. They, the, the Jewish scriptures uh, uh, go back with all the promises and the covenants. This is our Old Testament. And, and, and everything that, uh, the thing that he promised to David is that one of his descendants would reign on the throne of Israel as the Messiah. And the prophets clarified what was going to happen. The government will be on his shoulders. And there will be a worldwide recognition of who he is. And so these guys get it. They're like, hey, we need to guarantee our place. We're going to beat the crowd here. John, how about if you sit on his right, I'll sit on his left. We're going to ask Jesus for it. We're going to be at the top of his government. Well, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Huh? How can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He asked him that question. Can you be? We can. They answered, Jesus said to them, well, you will drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those 
for whom they've been prepared. In verse 41, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Why do you think they were indignant? They didn't think of it first. That's why they were indignant. It's not because they were, they were trying to wax righteous. You know, how dare they think about that? What they come up here and up there. Why didn't we think of that? Yeah, they're all selfish. And so, uh, and so, you know, his followers were at the place where the rest of the world is. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? If I'm going to expend energy, something needs to come back to me. And a lot of us don't even know how to identify those things when we give in some way to someone else. There's some, sometimes some subconscious expectation when we give our, our life away or, or give something away or serve in some way. There's a subconscious ex- expectation that many of us have for something to come back to us. Jesus told his followers that they're going to have to have a major shift in their thinking. And that major shift is, it's not about me, it's about others in the name of Jesus. That is huge. That is a shift that many believers haven't taken yet, where they have embraced everything that Christ is about. They've welcomed uh, the the fact that their, their sins have been paid for. They've welcomed that, but then the implications of that visit their front doorstep, and that's a process for some folks of saying, it's not about me, it's about others. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, as this passage continues, Jesus called them together. And he said, he's going to explain to them what's wrong with them trying to push themselves to the top. He said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Wow. Now, he's not teaching proper management techniques. So if you're making widgets out there somewhere and going, Jesus has given us a wonderful business plan here. Uh, You know, if you serve people, they're going to want to serve better and make more stuff so we can make more money. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about how you can be more selfish in relationships, right? He's talking about how we need to be a slave and serve and give our life away without expecting anything back. That's what he's saying. For even as the Son of Man, look at verse 45, did not come to be served. Now, that's a shocking thing. The Son of Man, he's referring to himself as God because in Daniel chapter 7, you will read clearly that the Son of Man came walking on the clouds of, on the clouds of heaven and uh, approached the Ancient of Days, and we find the, everyone worshiping him. Who is worshiped in the Scriptures? None other than God himself. And so he's referring to himself as the Son of Man. God himself in human flesh, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's not why he came into the world. Though he has every right to be served and he deserves to be served and we will willingly serve him for all of eternity, uh, he came into this world to purchase us for himself, to go to the lowest place he could possibly go, a humiliating death on a cross, hanging there under the curse of God so that the Father poured out his wrath on Jesus instead of us to pay for our sin, our past, our present, and our future sin, all of it for the entirety of our life to pay for that and give us his righteousness so that we can get into heaven? You see, that's a, that's a job of a servant. That's a, that's a God-like servant job where he entered our world and served us by doing that. Jesus came as an act of service. And when the Apostle Paul is thinking as he's communicating to the Philippian congregation how he can help them come from a place of asserting themselves and and, and demanding in relationships and not lowering themselves and being humble, he could think of no greater example than exactly what we just talked about here. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7, what does he say? He said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. 
So as his followers, we have to have the same attitude, the same mindset. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Though he's God himself, existing as God in heaven, uh, hidden from our sight for all of eternity past, recognized for who he is in his fullness of his glory. He didn't, when they had that conversation about this fallen race of humanity uh, purchasing them back when, when the father said, son, it's necessary for you to enter human history uh, and add a human nature to your divine nature for you to go to a place, hang on a cross uh, un- under the curse uh, that they deserve, uh, but you're, you're going to need to enter as a human being and do this. Jesus didn't go, no, I can't leave all this. You see, though it would have been his for all of eternity after he rose from the dead as it is now. But he didn't consider equality with God something to grasp. He willingly said, I will lower myself and veil my glory among them, right? And so that's what happened. We saw him with veiled, uh, his glory veiled to a certain extent. Yeah, we saw him heal people. We can read how people would go, who can do that but God? Or when he spoke with great authority, who speaks like that except God? And so his glory was, can, could be seen by people whose hearts have been prepared and who are, are reasonable in their thinking. But, uh, but as far as his appearance, Isaiah 53 said, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. The average person walking down the street might look at Jesus and go, eh, he's a three. You know what I mean? That's what Isaiah is teaching us. And so, you know, it's not like, whoa, he's the handsomest guy in the room. He's got to be the Messiah. You know? Uh, You know, he veiled his glory, and he was willing to do that. And so he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He didn't push himself up, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So there he is. God himself adds a human nature to his divine nature. So if you ask, is he really God? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Well, I thought he was a man. Is he really a man? Yes, absolutely, 100%. He's the God man. He entered human history, and notice what it says He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And so if you were to ask the question, is our God a servant? The answer would be yes. He serves. And at heart, he knows how to lower himself to serve. See, this is powerful for us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Even as a man. He came from heaven. Okay, uh, 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 we see him as a man. But now, as a human, he lowers himself to the most humiliating place. A place where criminals are crucified. Murderers along that road. And people were used to seeing that. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so what's our supreme example? that when the subject of serving comes up, the immediate image should be our God stepping out of heaven, adding a human nature to his divine nature, and going to a place of execution so he could wash our filthy souls clean, just like he washed his disciples' feet. That's exactly what happened. And he calls us to do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. So when we think about serving here, I want to point out some things that are extremely important when you process what it means for you to serve and me. This is the first thing. Go to God and not to others for your needs. Go to God and not to others for your needs. This can be important. You know, after, after a tough and, and, and discouraging day at work, Melvin came home, plopped himself on the, on the couch and He's in a melancholy mood. He says, nobody cares about me. 
In fact, the whole world hates me. And his wife saw this pity party he was throwing. He says, oh, honey. She said, the whole world can't hate you because most of the world hasn't even met you yet. You know? You know have you ever been in a funk uh, when you don't think that others are coming through for you in some way? And others are coming through for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question. What happens when you want something from someone else, but you don't get it? Now, I'm going to tell you how I, I do marriage counseling uh, before someone is married. I convince both of them that the other person is never going to meet their needs. That's probably the best counsel you will ever get someone who's getting married. That person will never meet your needs. Right from the beginning, don't expect that person to meet the deepest needs of your life. Because that's what we do down here, don't we? We walk around, we try to squeeze from other people what we think we need. And, you know, if we're given something, we better be getting something. Because, you know, I'm trying to meet your needs and you better be meeting my needs. And the problem with that is, is you're always very aware that they're not meeting your needs the way you want them met, Right? So there has to be, when it thinks, comes to you giving your life away, there has to be a source of strength that you tap into that isn't from somebody else so that you can give your life away without expecting anything back from that person. There has to be a source of power for that. So when you think of serving, you have to tap into that power. You have to understand that power. You have to understand your position in Christ so that you understand everything that you ever need will be met in a relationship with him so that you can give your life away without expecting something back from somebody else. You know, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that's exactly what this is all about. Why do fights and quarrels happen among you? What causes them? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you can't have what you want. That's where fights come from. Because you're not looking to God. You're looking for someone else to meet your needs, and you're trying to squeeze it out of them. You do not have because you do not ask God. Well, there's a novel thought. Why don't I ask God? But what are they going to when, when they ask God selfishly? Help me out with what I want, Lord. Give me that thing that I want. He says, but you don't, you don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. In other words, your complete posture in life is not serving God. What can I do for you? I want to give my life away to others in the name of God, uh, in the name of Christ. Uh, no, it's not that posture. It's what can I get out of life for myself? What's going to work for me? What's going to benefit me the most? And we walk through life doing that. We take and we take and we take and we take. Why are there divorces? Why are there broken relationships scattered all over the place? That very reason. People want something, but they don't get it from somebody else. And so they move on to the next person. And what do they find out? They want something from that person that they're not going to get either. And sometimes it's serial relationships that produce this kind of thing. You know, it's interesting, Stan Makita was a former uh, professional hockey star. He used to get into a lot of fights during his games until he had uh, his eight-year-old daughter ask him this question one time. She said, Daddy, she said, how can you score goals when you're always in a penalty box? <laughs> Eight years old, he said it changed the way he played the game. Because that's not the goal, it's just to get out there and fight. There's a different goal. And if you're in this life to serve Jesus, guess what's going to happen? You're going to change your goal. You're not going to be out there behaving the way that you need. You're going to be giving your life away rather than taking. And, and you know, uh, when you think about this question, what is it that you need from another human being? Not a single thing. And Jesus, as a matter of fact, just to remind you, in John chapter 2, verse 23, listen to this. Well, now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Well, of course. 
I'll follow you, Lord. Uh, and you know what? I, I'm good. We're going to vote for you when the time comes. In verse 24, but, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Hey, my constituency is coming to me, and they're, they're telling me they're going to vote for me, and he's going, I don't trust them. I'm not going to count on them for anything. What does it say here? For he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew it was in a man. Well, how did Jesus live his life? He didn't count on other people to bring him to the places he needed to be. He didn't count on other people to come through for him. You know how he lived his life? The same way we're called to live our life. Father, what do you want me to do? Fill me up so that I can give my life away. Father, what do you want me to do? Lead me, guide me. You're the one that I depend on. You're the one who's protecting me. You're the one who sustains me. And point me in the direction you want me to go. You see, it wasn't, hey, are you guys going to help me out here? You're going you're gonna to come through for me? Because if you don't, I'm host. See, that's how we live our life. We look for other people to come through for us. And Jesus knew that from the beginning. He's God, as the God man, it's, it's the Father who sustains me. You know, uh, if you want to go back to John 13 with me, just for a moment, and look at something significant. Remember John 13 where he took the towel, put it around his waist, and started washing their feet? Why did he do that? Well, we're told in the text that we might have just glossed over when we read it. In John 13, verses 3 and 4, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. What motivated him to do that? He knew who he was. He knew exactly who he was. From eternity past to eternity future, he understood what the plan was. So, he was able to get up from the meal, lower himself, and give his life away. And you know what? It's the same way with you and I. If you're a believer in Christ, what he's done is he's forgiven you for every single sin that you've ever committed. He's given you his righteousness so that you can walk into heaven without being condemned for all of eternity. He's made you alive when you were dead. He entered your life, made you born again as what Jesus told us. He gave us, he made us new creatures in Christ. He calls you his adopted children. Seated us in the heavenlies with Christ. All these things that we're told about who we are. So, we don't lose a thing when we give our life away. Not one thing if you know who you are. You can give your life away all day long and not lose a thing. Not lose one thing. Second, we need to understand about serving is give your life away in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know, I've often heard, and you might have as well in relationships, I've often heard the phrase repeated when someone's feelings were hurt, this. I gave and I gave and I gave. And not once did they even think about doing something nice for me. You might have used that phrase before. In a moment of hurt where you parted company with a group of people or parted company with a person. I gave and I gave and I gave, and not once did they do anything nice for me. Let that sink in for a moment. Because someone who serves gives their life away and doesn't expect anything back. That's true service. Remember I mentioned before, subconsciously, we really think something should come back to us. When you understand who you are, that relationship that you have, you don't need anything from anybody else, you can give your life away all day long in the name of Jesus. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, a very short sentence. Look what it says there. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because of Jesus and what he's done for us, we can submit to one another. Now, you know where that, that verse is positioned? Right before Ephesians, Paul goes in, into the three greatest relationships in any society. The husband-wife relationship, 
the parent-child relationship, and then the, if you would, the boss-worker relationship, which is masters and slaves in the scriptures relationship at the time. And so, before he discusses the finer points of how each in those relationships should respond to each other, he gives the guiding principle for all of the relationships that we have in life. Submit to one another out of reverence to, for Christ. Lower yourself and serve in those relationships. The husband should lower himself and serve in the way God calls him to in that marriage. The wife should lower herself and serve in the way God calls her to in that relationship. The, the parent should lower themselves and say, I want the best for my children and serve them so that their long-term life would work out the way God wants it to. And the children should say, lower themselves and say, they're my parents, I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. And the boss should lower himself and say, you know what, these are human beings uh, who are under my employer or, or in my care and I'm going to do what's best for them. And the, the people serving in those positions uh, should say, you know what, he's the, or she's the, the, the boss here and I'm going to serve in any way that I can. Submit yourself to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not because it's going to work out better for you. Out of reverence for Christ. You know, uh, uh, Paul's mindset was interesting. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 21, if you were to ask the Apostle Paul, what's your life about? What are you in it for? Here's what he would have said. Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He would have said, I would love uh, to uh, uh, die so that I can be in his presence, right? In verse 22, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Isn't that the way it is sometimes? Man, I'm all the pain would be over. I'd be in his presence. Uh, I get to experience him forever, which is better by far. But it's more necessary. Listen to what he says. It's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Why is he alive? Others, in the name of Jesus. That sums up his life. Others, in the name of Jesus. Because if I'm gone from here, it's going to be about Jesus for all of eternity. And while I'm here, it's going to be about Jesus, and I'm giving my life away. Listen to what he says. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, in verse 25, and I will continue with all of you for my progress. No, for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. I'm here for you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus motivating me to give my life away for you. You know, for, for some of us, the thought of giving our time or energy away into doing anything that isn't going to benefit us in some way, even sometimes people in our world who don't know God like to do good for others because it gives them a good feeling. You'll hear that on news reports sometimes where they're interviewing someone. Why do you do this? I just get a good feeling about it. Well, you get a good feeling out of it. What if that good feeling isn't there? What if you're lowering yourself in such a way that there is no good feeling about it? Well, that's called service. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, here's what Jesus called it. He said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus said, you're going to follow me? Guess what? You're going to die every day. You're going to die. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Jesus is saying, it's about giving your life away for me in my name. And uh, I'm going to give you this. Uh, to close this point off, whenever you do an act of service, I'm going to just give you a suggestion. Never, never leave someone with the impression that you're just a good person doing a good deed. Never leave someone with that impression. 
that you're just a good person doing a good deed. Because number one, you're not a good person without God. You just aren't. I was never a good person without God. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I was convinced there wasn't a God, I'd be the most selfish person you would ever see in your life. Because I didn't come up from the goo through the zoo to give my life away. I fought my way to this place, according to our world's teaching. I'm, I'm, I've duked it out. We're at the top of the chain, man. And you know what? Only the strong survive. And I don't care what anyone else wants. If I'm just going to go into the grave and that's it for me, just going to fertilize a tree and there's nothing beyond this, you're going to find the most selfish person you have ever seen. And that will be philosophically correct for this world. The only reason I give my life away, and many of you do, is because there is a God who turned you from a selfish person when he forgave you for your sin into someone who wants to serve him. And so when you do a good deed, it's not because you would have normally and naturally done that. It's because the living God is in you and motivated you to do that in his name. And so when you do a good deed and there's that opportunity, make sure people know why you're doing it. If they haven't already associated you with Jesus or, or uh, uh, with uh, the God you serve in some way, make sure they understand that at some point, for sure. And the third and final and quick thing I want to share here is this. When you think of serving, Jesus inconveniences people. He inconveniences us. We love convenience. What works best for us, uh, the easy thing. The thing that makes us, uh, uh, gives us the most pleasure. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Because we get a good feeling about following Jesus. We get to see all the good things that he does. And, you know, if it works in my schedule, uh, you know, then I'm happy with it. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. How about that? I don't even have a good bed to lay on. You willing to hang with that? He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. He just summed up everything with that phrase. You can uh, imagine what plowing was like in those days. You'd, you'd grab a plow behind a couple of uh, uh, very powerful animals, or maybe one, and they're doing the work, but you're doing the guiding, and you better keep your eye on what you're doing, because if you're turning around going, man, I, I don't really feel like doing this, nothing's going to happen, and you're going to mess up, you're going to get twisted up, and no productivity. He's saying, listen, Serving is about keeping your hand to the plow and pointing yourself in the direction God wants you to go and saying, I'll do this for you, Lord. I'll do this for you. Even though it's inconvenient for me, I want to plow the road that you want me to plow. The one, number, one, number one reason why people uh, don't make decisions to serve is because of inconvenience. It just doesn't fit with their schedule. It's inconvenient for them. You know, I think of, uh, I was actually thinking, uh, of this recently uh, because uh, some of you remember one of our deacons who moved out of town, Scott Bovard. Uh, he came back into town here and he joined us for the prayer meeting that we had. And as he was, he was pulling the, the cross out, you know, we're going to put it on the table so that we can have that, that focus as we, we prayed, uh, you know, the cross tilted and, and that bar came flying off for a moment there and Scott grabbed it real quick and he said, something's got to be done here. So immediately put into action uh, fixing that thing. So we have a cross that you can beat someone over the head with and, 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 not, uh, and, and it won't come apart. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he made sure that that thing was solid again. But he's the one that made that cross to begin with. And I remember years ago when we uh, had a Christmas Eve service, I, uh, we had a kind of a special thing that we wanted to do. And I said, Scott, can you make a cross? Because I knew he was capable of it. It t took some time, obviously. And of course. He's, he's one of those kind of guys that always said yes. And if he couldn't say yes, it was really, really because he couldn't. And he would say yes every time. And uh, 
man, he came up with this. Wonderful. You see those nails in the side? I didn't even know this until he was putting that bar back on, but he filed the edges of those nails to make them square like those Roman nails that they, they, they put in the cross. And something else that I didn't notice before either, he spent time, you see kind of the, by the nails, that kind of a dark line that kind of goes down from, from uh, where the nails are? It's kind of an outline of possibly what it might have looked like for Jesus to hang on the cross so you kind of see a shadow possibly of what Christ would be there. It took time for him to do that. You know, I'm pointing him out because it was wonderful to renew the relationship when he came back up to visit, but there are other people in this church right now sitting right here, back in the sound booth, people up here on the stage, people back there, uh, uh, you know, sacrificing themselves for the children uh, uh, and, and making sure that they're being taught and encouraged and, uh, and many other things. You drive in here and you see, the, uh, you see the lawn nicely mowed and you go, wow, what a great place. We don't hire anyone to do that. The deacons do that and people who want to join them join in with the mow teams and they make this place look great. And there's plenty of other things that people do here that uh, you're going to go, what about this? And I'm going, I forgot that one, right? I'm not being comprehensive here. But it's only because people have put something on their calendar and said, I will serve. I'll give my life away to build the body of Christ here. And I guess that's my application here as we close this message off. Is just put something on your calendar in two places. I'm just going to limit it to two places. At home, at home, there may be in your relationship with your, your mate, uh, your wife or your husband, or, or with your parents or your children, there may be something that you're thinking, I'm totally selfish. I don't serve. I don't give like I should. And there's something that might come to your mind even now where you're thinking, there's something I can do on a regular basis that I don't feel like doing. I just don't. But I'm going to do it because Jesus is my master. He's given me everything I need, and I don't need anything from anybody else in this house necessarily. And so I'm going to give my life away here. I'm going to just put this in my weekly routine or my daily routine. I'm going to give my life away. I'm going to serve at home. Children parents, husband, wife. And the second, put something on your calendar for the body of Christ here in this community you're involved with. Something on a weekly basis. Something on a monthly basis. I would suggest weekly. I'd be happy with that. You'd make me smile if you want to think to yourself, I want a good feeling and you see my smile, you go, okay, I'm not serving Jesus, but I'd like to see Ben smile. Just do that. Just say yes to something here. Just say, I'm going to give my life away for you, Lord. For you, Lord. And on a weekly basis, I may not feel like doing it. Like right now, I, I mean, there's some people who really feel like serving in the area of children's ministry. And you should have a smile on back there. But you know what? It's a necessary thing for this church. And uh, it's a necessary thing to be involved with production. It's a necessary thing for musicians. Some of you have musical talent you haven't stepped forward with yet. Jonathan's going to grab you as soon as you smile at him. And uh, we have a wonderful team here, don't we? But, you know, these are all people who give their time on a, on a rotation, on a regular basis. And so put something on your calendar. I want to close with this. Uh, you know, it's something I've shared before, but it's probably the most powerful thing I've heard in my personal experience. I was on staff at a church in Los Angeles for a short time, part-time, uh, and, and there was a guy that I met with and prayed with and uh, just a good friend, you know, we encouraged each other. And uh, he told me about his father who had passed away, and I, I just asked him some questions about his dad. I said, what's the most, most positive memory you have about your dad? You know, one of those kind of conversations. And he, uh, he said, I'll tell you what, what the most positive memory was. He said, when I was about eight to, you know, early teens, my dad would get me out of bed before the sun came up. He says, you know how hard that is for a teenager? He said, I, I, I hated it. But he'd get me out of bed before the sun came up, and we would go up to the church property, and we would we would weed around the church, we would uh, take care of the church property, and then when the sun started coming up, we would go home. 
He said, I was so frustrated one time and angry with him in the car as we drove up to the church together. Uh, he, he, said, uh, he said, I just I, I got out of the car uh, and I, I said, Dad, why do we do this when it's dark and no one can even see us? And uh, he said his dad got down on one knee in front of him. He said, that's exactly why we do it in the dark so that no one can see us because we're doing it for him. And uh, he said, I left a lifetime impact on him. You know, here he is, a man in his uh, early, uh, late 20s, or early 30s, and he, it drove him in his personal life, that example. It's not about being seen by others. It's about serving the living God, saying, I will serve others. I will give my life away because I'm serving you. See? And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can come to you and thank you that we can focus our attention on what you've done for us, stepping out of heaven, serving us, paying the price that we owed you so that we could spend eternity with you. Thank you for doing that for us. I ask, Father, that those in this room who love you and who have gotten that and assimilated it and, and are living out what you've asked us to do by serving others, that they would continue to find that strength in you and, and give their lives away. And Father, I pray for anyone who is a believer, but they're living a selfish life right now. It's all about them. They might even be involved in something they shouldn't be because it works for them. Lord, I ask that you would do a work to bring them to that place where they would say, it's all about you, Lord. And it's all about serving you. And Father, I pray for anyone who may not know you today. And they might say, I'm not sure I know God. But I want to. I would pray, Lord, that you would open their hearts, they would turn their hearts to you, you would grant them repentance, that they would see things as you see them. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment, your eyes closed. I'm not going to ask anyone to, to do anything other than spend a moment or two in prayer in their heart as you talk to God. And, you know, if you love him, tell him what you love about him. Praise him in your heart. Give him thanks for a moment or two. If you know him and, and you know that you're not really aligned with what he wants right now, confess whatever that is to him. Align yourself with him. Maybe you don't know him. And you're thinking to yourself, I, I want to. I want my sin forgiven. I want to spend eternity with God. I want to be his person. But you might not know what to say. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you're thinking, those are the words I want to use, go ahead and use those as you talk to God. There's nothing wrong with that if you agree with them. Lord Jesus, I need you. I've been selfish and living life for myself. I've done a lot of things that you hate. Will you forgive me? I trust what you did for me. And I know you're alive. Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus, amen.